And welcome back. Brief housekeeping note before we get on to the next talk. Uh, if you get warm and fuzzies helping people out, there are plenty of spots left for our mentored uh, sprints happening tomorrow. Check out the website on the Sunday tab to find out more. And now I'm joined by Tennessee. Hello, Tennessee. Long time no see. Hello. Lovely to see you again. <laughs> Tennessee will be presenting Making Code Bases Easier to Learn and Maintain. So, Tennessee, I'll let you have at it. Thank you very much. Okay, well, welcome very, uh, welcome very much to my talk, uh, Making Code Bases Easier to Learn and Maintain. I've thrown a, keep a, a quick overview uh, on the slide here for those who, who want to see what's coming. Uh, but mostly I just want to take a few minutes just to uh, say how pleased I am to be here in this PyCon AU online format. I think it's wonderful the communities come together to, to put this together. It's just a, an amazing achievement by everyone. Some brief notes. Uh, this presentation contains ideas which I hope you find useful. It's not meant to be prescriptive uh, or, or taken as definitive. It's supposed to uh, help people think through different ways of approaching their code. The code examples are illustrative only, uh, written for the purpose of talking about clarity and un understandability, so don't use them in production. The code examples were all written by me for this presentation and are not ac excerpts from actual code bases. So first of all, the primary question, is lack of clarity a real problem? Uh, the short answer is yes. Issues of readability and clarity are commonplace in real world, world code bases. I've never seen or written a code base that didn't have uh, at least some room for improvement, uh, I dare say, even including the code in this presentation. So let's look at the benefits. Is it worthwhile to put effort into clarity? So the, the benefits are, are roughly as follows, efficiency, simplicity, helpfulness, self-interest, and professionalism. Code is very complex. Large code bases are really hard to work with and understanding and maintaining it is quite time consuming. So anything we can do to uh, improve upon that is worth doing. Simplicity helps in a number of ways. Not only is it more efficient by itself, it's also e easier to check and validate and confirm it's doing the right thing. Uh, helpfulness is another motivator. Uh, we don't live in a bubble, we work with others uh, and others work with the code we write. So making code easier to understand and easier to maintain is something that will help them. That includes future you. When we return to a code base, any of us as a developer, some of that context and knowledge that we had when we wrote the code uh, may not be there anymore. And we may very much appreciate our uh, leaving some notes for ourselves when we come back later. And then finally, professionalism. To write code of greater value, uh, whether that's in a business context or an open source context. Some things to be aware of when considering whether your code makes sense to yourself and to others, your own knowledge, expertise, and focus, and of course, your own gaps and biases. The differing expertise, knowledge, or opinions of others, including the immediate team, other stakeholders. Now, you may interact even on, even on matters of code, you may interact with a wider environment and context. Certainly, there's an awareness aspect of that wider environment and context, but you may find yourself sharing code with people you didn't anticipate sharing code with uh, or discussing it with them in various forums. This is a rubric that I use uh, to consider the different perspectives that are relevant to developing a code base. Uh, I'll very briefly pause to define what I'm terming a code base here. For, for me, it's everything that's in the, in the directory of a code base, and that's going to con consider um, comprise source code, obviously. It's also going to comprise documentation, both in the code and separately. It may comprise assets like images and branding and files and, and things of that nature. It's everything that comes together to form, form a running and executing application is a, in the extended part of the code base. Most of this presentation focuses on the code, but it's all, all in scope. Um, code, like a piece of writing, can be more or less clear in and of itself. There's ways of, of being more expressive with code. Then code draws in various technologies. You might have a web application uh, or a, a data processing application, and the particular libraries and frameworks and technologies of use are, are part of that code base and how you understand it and how you approach it. Having code that's consistent uh, and compatible with the technologies you're trying to use will make it easier to understand and maintain that code base. 
Then there's the application view, how the code draws the technologies in to build a running application. Understanding the major application flows and processes may allow you to structure your code better to be more consistent with those application flows or may allow you to use language and terminology in the code that matches what's happening in the application better. Then there's a wider context. I originally called this understand the business. I had in mind a situation where perhaps a developer moved from say a, a law application to a banking application. The terminology and design principles and priorities are naturally inherent in one business context or open source context or value context may be different uh, depending on, on what kind of thing is trying to be achieved and illuminating that within the code base may make it easy to understand why things are the way they are. A large uh, fundamental tenet of this talk is that a huge part of the maintainability side of the question is actually the understandability or clarity side of that question. The clearer something is, the faster and easier it is to work with. So let's go through and see this as applies to a series of examples, commencing with some thoughts on doc strings. So here's an example doc string. I would go so far as to say this is a fairly clear doc string. Uh, it, 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 it's short, uh, it's fairly easy to understand, it, it's accurate, uh, so that this is referring to a hypothetical function, uh, which does exactly what it says on the tin. However, considering those perspectives which I introduced further uh, earlier, I feel like it doesn't tell you why it's doing what it's doing. And that can be important if we wanted to consider, say, changing what it was doing or using it in a different context. I'll present a, an expanded example of, this, of a doc string for the same hypothetical function. In this case, we describe a purpose, give an example, and leave notes. Um, so I've written this uh, in a way to provide more information. So I've said, this function is used to bucket incoming widgets based on their size. So this isn't an abstract bucketing function. It's not a, a, a primary utility function. It's for an intended purpose. It needs to be done to separate widgets into categories, those which take up a lot of vertical real estate and those with don't, which don't. So the code is here hinting towards the application functionality as well as just what the code does. Uh, then there's an example which further illustrates what the code does. And then finally in the notes, it talks a little about the business context. So it makes it clear that the decision to base uh, the bucketing algorithm and, and, and the uh, methods involved only on the length of the widget rather than say on width or area is coming from a user requirement. It's coming from the business context. So it provides more hints about that wider context. It doesn't completely describe them all, but it does provide more information. So what are some suggestions for improving doc strings? Concentrate on intentions over implementations. Uh, examples are very valuable and make it clear what the requirements are and potentially what design choices were made through the process. You could consider adopting a semantic uh, documentation scheme such that particular sections of the doc string are consistently present uh, throughout a code base uh, and define a scheme that makes sense in your context. You could add an automatic comment checker. Let's consider structure. This example here is inspired by a real world, uh, uh, very widely deployed open source library. Uh, the point here isn't to draw out or, or cast any, any criticism of this, it is what it is, and it's been a very successful library that's been deployed. I just want to make the point that this is a very real world scenario. And what I've done is largely modify the names and remove a few elements um, that were uh, making it a more confusing slide to pr present. Now, I find this structure a little confusing. I've got no doubt that with a detailed understanding of the library, it would be possible to properly understand the structure. However, it doesn't in and of itself present a lot of information. Why are there two documentation directories? Why would I look put a file in one or the other? What is the difference between what is in source and what is in lib? In this context, both of those files were source codes for this application and library. So it wasn't a distinction between what was in and out of some kind of scope with regards to the application, and it wasn't immediately clear to me. Here's a potential alternative. This is the same uh, hyper, this is, this is considering the same application, but immediately the type of documentation is totally clear. 
from the naming present in the structure. Uh, all of the source code for the application is in the source folder. And in this case, I've suggested pulling the tests out from the, uh, the source code directories and separating it structurally from the source code to, to make it uh, faster and clearer to identify where you would find the tests in this particular context. So I like to think of structure as a table of contents to navigate code. Uh, it's an explanation. It affords an opportunity to explain to a developer where things should go and potentially why they should go there. It can be used to separate the interface, which means the parts of the source code which uh, someone relying on the library may use and rely on from the internals, which are, provide functionality but may experience more change or be uh, less relied upon by the user. And I'd recommend avoiding where possible overloading generic terms. Don't use a generic term for more than one purpose if it's possible to avoid it by being a little more specific. Let's take a look at maintainability, readability, and expressive code. I have this uh, idea around how to consider this, that writing code goes forward. Before we write a piece of code, uh, there's an idea that we need to do so. There's some goal in mind, probably some pre-existing understanding of the code base as it is now uh, and, and functionality or features that we're trying to implement and probably an understanding of the business context around why this should be the case. Uh, here's an example method uh, for that, that someone might well write in such a situation. It's designed to handle some user input. Uh, it, takes, it, it sits in an object-oriented context there's a request, which in this case is uh, storing some user attributes and preferences, and then a selection of attributes by which this function can constrain its processing down to just uh, attributes of key relevance. So it may not consider every, every user preference that the uh, user has, has put in the request. And then it goes through this process of converting things to base64. It's not particularly clear why, but it does. And then it goes through and checks the validity of the preferences and stores them. But does it improve any understanding of why this is a value to the user or what the business context is? Does it explain what the application is doing or improve the understanding of the technology or even the code in any particular way? It's not unclear code. It's clear what it's doing, but it's still hard to assess what kinds of changes would be possible without breaking expectations and what kind of things are being relied upon in terms of the way it functions. Uh, so I've presented an improved version. Now, the improved version is broken over two slides, the first one focusing on the doc string and the second one omitting the doc string for reasons of space on the screen. And the reason I've done, uh, the principle I've put into this, the improved version is that understanding goes backwards, which is that when there's an issue or a change that you want to make, understanding what's already there occurs in that function or in that line of code you'll be less well armed with the objectives of the develop that the original developer have in mind, less aware of the business context than when the original developer put it in place. So first we see a doc string again. That's not the main point of this example, but it is illustrative. So first of all, it starts with this function is used widely. It becomes immediately clear that we need to take seriously the potential implications of any changes to this function and probably it means that every line of this code is doing something that's been carefully considered uh, due to its wide use. So it prepares user input for caching preferences. That was something that was reasonably clear. Uh, it calls out that this is the step which sanitizes user input for application use. So what that means is, is there's some awareness that the supplied data might be uh, incomplete or malformed and that we need to be tolerant to unexpected input conditions, which is quite useful to be aware of. And then uh, it clearly describes what these parameters are and which ones are considered safe and unsafe. And it indicates up front uh, in that first comment why we're doing this conversion to base64, which is largely because the base64 of any string is a more or less safe string. There are, in fact, some special characters in, in base64, which if uh, relied upon in the wrong way could potentially rely on an application break. But by and large, base64 thing is a safe thing to be working with. So here's the rest of the code implementation with that doc string removed. So this illustrates uh, a process of chunking the stages of processing of this function up, and it becomes clearer what's happening at each stage. 
So we, t we convert the user input to base64 so that we can use it safely. We match it against pre-existing expectations or standard attributes if they're supplied. And then we filter that down to the relevant attributes the user has passed in and go through some more processing, including checking the safety of the actual preference values. This provides much more information, perhaps not about the business use or the value, but certainly about the application and certainly about the technologies involved. There are also some readability points, which I addressed after initially uh, prototyping this application. The first one is a very small thing. How I go about doing the conversion to base 64. I've realized that one subtle tweak, particularly focusing on that last line for relevant, is that I can improve the clarity of that list comprehension simply by reversing the order of those two variables in the tuple. Putting them this way separates, puts the atta variable uh, on the left, matching where I'm building the list. So it matches the elements of the list that will remain after the comprehension is completed. And it places the B64 variable towards the right of the list comprehension where it's used in considering the if statement, which filters what's going on. That led me to a further iterative realization. There was another possible improvement, this attributes variable. The attributes variable here describes what is contained in the variable, which is a common way to choose to name things. But an alternative is to name things according to what they're used for, in this case, a filter. I find it clearer to, just, to, to name this filter rather than attributes because when used in the list comprehension, it's very clear what's going on. Even if uh, list comprehensions aren't, aren't your forte or you're not used to this particular pattern of development, by calling out the word filter, it becomes clearer. So what are some steps to improve readability? We've introduced each section of code with a comment describing its intention, used names which better hint towards the purpose of variables, and adopted naming conventions which are consistent across the code base. And in this case, consistent means, ideally, consistent with the technology, the application, and the business context or value context or user context, depending how you want to consider that. Let's have a few thoughts on modularity. So let's take another real world example, except that 300 lines of real world Python in a single main method is not great content for a slide. It was clear, clear enough code, but there was a lot of it, um, which led to a number of potential issues and risks. And what I've got here in the next slide is my improved version of that main method. The same 300 lines of code as were present in the original would still need to execute in some way, shape, or form. However, by chunking them up and, and using functions to, to group the code and just use function names that describe what that code is doing, it's possible to understand that code much more rapidly. I'll, let's walk through the example on this slide. So we have a main method. It's very clear it's a web application. It describes data for a case study, which is uh, immediately obvious from the doc string and was not immediately obvious from the, co from the uh, prior original code. And the data and the layout are specified in this configuration variable. The original in the code had multiple different 300 line examples uh, rather than using something slightly more modular. And then it describes how that could be passed in. So we load the configuration, possibly some standard configuration if nothing's passed in. There's some code dealing with fetching data, some code dealing with defining a layout, and some code dealing with the technology, which is uh, preparing the layout and then presenting it to the user. So the, the parts are separated. Uh, the, the business context or value or purpose is described in the doc string. The elements of code dealing with the application, fetching the data, defining the layout are, are done separately. And then the interaction with the technology, which is the library used to, to initialize and start and present the web server is also well separated and very clear. Uh, it also reduces the risk of unexpected interactions between parts of the code. When too much code is present at once, it might be easy, for example, uh, for variables or functions or um, that are used in loading the data to either accidentally uh, get reused when preparing the code for layout, leading to the potential for unexpected interactions, or possibly deliberately being reused. But then it means that any possible change to them has very broad consequences across these different areas. So 
what we've done in modularity, so chunking, grouping, and decoupling are three very common concepts uh, when considering modularity. But I also want to talk about the idea of storytelling, breaking down things into a series of parts which, where the main purpose is not necessarily just chunking, grouping, or decoupling, but is just to make the narrative flow of the application easier to read for the developer. Thoughts on tests. Testing uh, is a complex area. Let's consider this simple example. Uh, it's not a bad example. None of these examples are bad examples to begin with. This is about improvement, not about calling out what's, what's good or bad. So here, the first uh, element of these examples is, is fairly clearly what the main purpose of this bucketing functioning is, grouping a list into two parts, a couple of examples dealing with edge cases. It's reasonably clear to understand. It's not obvious which ones constitute a requirement versus which ones are a design choice, or versus which ones are mainly maybe a smoke test or regression test just to make sure it didn't break. Here's a slightly improved version. This is not bad at all. I'd be quite happy as a developer to come across this. I find it fairly clear. It separates things into requirements, um, edge cases, design choices, or regressions, however you'd want to express that, uh, and invalid data is explicitly dealt with. So there are more cases being handled and it's clear where they came from. So it's clear what types of changes a developer could make and what the implications might be. Changing something which is uh, merely an edge case or regression handling may not have any end user requirement uh, impacts because it doesn't change a requirement. So it's useful to express a bit of detail about why a test is present. Uh, it's possible to go further as well uh, to make this clear and draw it out even, even further, but it may not potentially be worth the added complexity or effort of doing so. But here's an example of how you might want to approach adding uh, even more detail to a test. The other reason you might want that extra complexity is that for some types of tests, the actual uh, code to perform the test can get much more complex if there's a lot of mocking um, or uh, abstraction or complex object behavior subject to test, which is separate from the input, input conditions which are driving those tests. And in that situation, you might, might want to move to a test fixture. Uh, this is an example test fixture where the test values have been put not only in a separate file, but not even a Python file, a CSV file, which could be interpreted. I'll focus in just on this reason column. By adding this extra commentary on why the tests are in place, it's very quick to see what was in the developer's mind, uh, in this case, my mind, uh, when trying to work out what to look for and why to check for it. So again, it's clear about what's a requirement, what's an edge case, what's an exception. It's also quick to see whether or not that, that comment or requirement or piece of documentation matches the implementation. Uh, that I've often seen criticisms of either excessive documentation or documentation as such that implementations can drift which is certainly the case, um, particularly if the comments focus on what the code currently does rather than the purpose or the requirement or the intention. If you can lift the, um, the, the commenting upper level, it can support what the goal is, and then the developer can more easily assess whether that difference between implementation and, doc and comment uh, is significant or important to them. So let's take a look at, uh, at these three. Uh, I won't go back and look at the exact input conditions that lead to them, but straight away we can see there's a reasonably comprehensive approach to the testing, and it would be relatively straightforward to just focus in on the input and output conditions without considering the actual implementation logic that took us to get there. So when maintaining and using tests, be clear about requirements, technical choices, edge cases, regressions. Make the logic of the text clear and the business logic of the text clear. So to conclude, why go about this? Uh, to improve efficiency, simplicity, helpfulness, self-interest, and to act out of professionalism. The perspectives we should bring to our, ourselves, our learning, the support of others, is to treat everything as an opportunity to provide additional insight into the value and use of the application or business context, the fundamental processes of the application, what it achieves and how it achieves them, the technologies that are in use, and then to make the code as readable as possible. Uh, what we did was focus on readability, first of all, uh, maintainability to a degree, uh, and modularity and very much clarity. And how we went about it was focusing on refactoring uh, to reveal purpose and documentation 
to reveal purpose. That's the conclusion. And then I have one final slide that anyone who would like to can push pause and read in more detail later. Uh, thank you very much. You timed that exactly on 25 minutes. That is that is definitely a slide that I need to screenshot and apply on Monday morning <laughs> to all my code bases. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that, Tennessee. And we'll be back in a few minutes with another talk.